Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the 100th episode of the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here, as most of the time, with Liberty Larry. How's it going? So you, so you know now you have to introduce every episode that way. No, no, I was just making sure that everybody knew that I actually say this every time. I don't have a pre-recorded intro. Uh, well, you don't have a pre... Yeah, well, they'll know that if you do it each episode individually There's now. no way that I... Most of the time, I don't even know what episode number it is until we're done. So that's true. It's very true. <laughs> I, don't, I don't keep track of those kind of things. We're like, lucky yeah. we caught that this was the 100th, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we could have had it all recorded and been like, oh, guess what? Yeah, we missed 50. 50 and 75 and various others like, yeah. oh, yeah, hey, look, uh, that episode was our 50th episode. Yeah. Well, uh, so we we had talked about doing something special, and then it, it occurred mostly to me as I get older that uh, age is just a number. It is just a number. And 100 <laughs> is just a number, too. And because of the way we numbered podcasts starting with zero and not counting the classics and the interviews and the, so forth, none of them getting numbered episodes, this is actually like 106 or something like that. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah. So it is what it is. Still (laughs) a milestone. It is a milestone. We've been doing this since January 2018. Is that right? I'm not sure. I don't know. Actually, I've I've been meaning to kind of go back and look. I don't know how many years we've been doing this. (laughs) Either 2018 or 2019. Let's see. Um, We don't. We definitely don't actually get. Let's. It must be 2019, right? Um, Because we the last good year. (laughs) <laughs> the last good year. Okay. Yeah. yeah, maybe. I, 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 like, it, I mean, I kinda, stand by that. Like. I mean, just think that like, if we started in January 2019, then most of the time that we've been doing this podcast yeah, has been under the COVID regime. And that can't be correct. Like, well, I'm, it could be. We're going to have to find out. <laughs> I, I don't feel like that's correct, though. But yeah. maybe. I mean, I, it's, I guess it's possible. I really Where's don't. My phone now. I gotta look. <laughs> I really don't feel like it's been that long, or it's been. I feel like it's been longer than that. So. Um. I don't know. I think that we're just. I mean, that's that's more than two and a half years. Yeah. It's yeah. A, COVID's been going on for a minute. Yeah, like a year and a half. Um, well, and this is a point that I actually. Where would I go to look this? Up? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, I have no clue. No, go ahead. Keep talking. Well, no, what I was going to say is kind of, um, I know Dave Smith talked about this, and it was something I wanted to make sure I kind of, at least on some point in the podcast, mentioned, is like all of these people that, like COVID's, like you hear the media say this all the time. That, all right, what year? Um, our fifth episode was March 1, 2019, so we must have started wow. January 2019. So, wow, we have been doing this for, so we have been going, I guess, a year before, close to a year before COVID. Um. But yeah, so like you hear the media say this all the time that COVID's not going away. Like mm-hmm. like they say that all the time. And I think they're right about that. Like yeah. COVID's not going away. And so what I would tell the people who are for like force mandate uh, vaccines or mask and all of this stuff um, is this isn't going away. So 10 years from now, do, do we want to still be, be well, I'm serious. Mask. Do we still want to be wearing masks and, and having lockdowns and mandates? Like, do we want to still be doing this 10 years from now? Um, and I know I don't want to live in that world. I mean, I, won't, I don't want to look back 10 years from now and be like, yeah, we're still doing this same bull. Um, and it's just something to kind of put some perspective for people who like hadn't really considered that because this isn't going away. Like the media, and it's funny because when the media says this isn't going away, they're, they're actually pushing for more mandates and more, Oh, we can't, we can't let our guard down. And like, I take that the opposite when they say that, like, yeah, this isn't going away. So we have to get back to normal at some point. Yeah. Like this can't continue. Yeah. Well, we certainly can't continue to live like this. Um, I mean, I, I've been ignoring this stuff for a while, so well, yeah, I, I've decided I. not to live like yeah. <laughs> like well, this, and the, you, you, the country is kind of divided in this respect, where like you have a group of people who are absolutely like gonna not live in that world where you know they're afraid of a virus, and you have the people who are <laughs> afraid of a virus, you know. Yeah. Um. Well, people. 
I mean, that's kind of what this is all about, right? Like this podcast is the people can make their own choices about their lives. And I'm all for that. The problem is where the mandates come in. Mm -hmm. Like, that's my problem. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, you know, and and I'm all for people taking whatever precautions they want, whatever that may be. I mean, if you want to lock yourself in your house, lock yourself in. But don't expect the government to pay your bills. Like, I have a problem with that. Yeah. But but beyond that. Because the government doesn't do it. We do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I I have your own bills. They're just (laughs) taking a percentage off the top. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I like but as far as like choice goes, like do whatever you think's best for you. I'm mm-hmm. all for that, but I'm not for the the mandates. That's that's where I draw the line. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, um I actually heard like a little bit of a Dave Smith episode where we were talking about an article from somebody claiming to be a libertarian and in the hill maybe or somewhere. I can't remember. Anyway, um, one of the things that he was saying is essentially that, um, that we should, uh, of the options of the available options, government mandates about vaccines or regular testing or whatever, we should go with the vaccines because most people would prefer that. Like, well, I mean, if you, like if most people would prefer it, you don't need a mandate. That's exactly the point. <laughs> exactly. And the thing is at this point, because the argument, the legitimate argument that's made, I won't say legitimate, the most legitimate argument that's made is that, well, if you don't get the vaccine, you're, you're putting other people at risk. Mm-hmm. Um, and while, like I say, I don't particularly prescribe to that at the same time, it, it, it's not that's not even an argument anymore because they've established that these vaccines don't prevent you from spreading it. Mm-hmm. So like now if that was the case if these vaccines present, prevented you from spreading the virus, you could make an argument I I think you could make a solid argument for people voluntarily taking it. I still wouldn't be okay with it being mandated. Yeah. But you could make a strong argument for everybody does need to get this vaccine mm-hmm. and to try to pressure people as much as you can. But that's not that that argument can't be made anymore. Yeah. It, with the with the, even by the CDC guidelines. Like nobody's saying that that by t- getting the vaccine you're not spreading. So, like, why, why is why the pressure campaign? Like, the government doesn't care about me that much. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> and they don't care about you that much either. Like, they don't care about anybody that much. So why the pressure campaign? Yeah. Well, and then that's kind of, well, why the pressure campaign? Because a lot of people stand to make a lot of money off of vaccine mandates. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's really what I think it's about. I mean, you can go deep into the tinfoil hat arena and talk about, you know, future... I don't know, population control or mind yeah. control or whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think it's a lot simpler. Just follow than the that. money. Yeah, just follow the money. Yeah. Um, I had a uh, an economics teacher that was also a history teacher. And um, one of the things that he said over and over again in the history classes was if you want to know about history, follow the money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, that makes sense because mm-hmm. and that's that's the that's the history that's going to tell the real story. Yeah. I mean, you're going to get the clearest picture that way. Yeah. I mean, these uh, drug companies are already raking in record revenues. Yeah. Um, and it, it's the great benefit to them is these uh, fear campaigns. Um, and it would be an even greater benefit to uh, to have mandates. Yeah. To have government enforced mandates or, yeah. you know, these things that are um, that keep cropping up that you hear from people all the time. Well, just don't let vaccinated people do anything. Yeah. yeah. Like That's... keep them out of everywhere. Lock them out of everywhere. Don't let them be employed. Don't let them go to the grocery store. Don't let them come into restaurants or bars or shopping centers or anything. Don't let them travel. Don't let them leave their home. Yeah. Um, let's let them starve. And if the choice is between starving or getting the vaccine, I bet they'll get the vaccine. That's the way people are approaching it. Yeah. And then it, that is kind of an incredible position to take as a human being in regards to other human beings. Yeah. Um, Especially for something that's supposed to be for your safety anyway. Yeah. So you're re- literally wanting to put people at risk for not mm-hmm. making the same choice you made. Yeah. Well, and, uh, you know, you were telling me that they're, um, I mean, you were the first person to bring this to my attention. There are doctors that are refusing to treat patients that haven't gotten the vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's a doctor that, um, my, that's kind of associated with where my wife works is, mm-hmm. is he hasn't made that move yet, mm-hmm. but, um, they were discussing at the office, an article about it, the a doctor that had made that the, locally here that had made that decision and he's, he's all on board for it. Yeah. Like, so at least one doctor in her office is like, yeah, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Well, and I, I read an article about a, uh, um, a heart transplant, 
a wait list person um, who'd been on the waiting list for a heart transplant for like two and a half years or three years or something like that. Um, finally, his name came up, and when he uh, refused to get the vaccine, they took away his heart, essentially. I mean, they, really? they, they took him off the list. Just took him off the list? Mm -hmm. See, and that's just, uh, it blows my mind. I don't know mind. how you square that as a physician with your... Yeah. I mean, the oath is do no harm, but... Yeah. Um, I don't know how you Isn't square that with your duty. with your ethics yeah. of why you entered the medical profession anyway. Yeah. Um, and do you start applying that to other things? I mean, like I, I can see an argument being made. Of, well, this is a um, this is a controllable health issue um, that yeah. if you just made the right choice, that you wouldn't have this problem. Well, but there's lots of those things going on. Do yeah. we refuse to treat patients that smoke? Do we refuse to treat patients that are uh, overweight? Do, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of that. Do we refuse to treat patients that refuse to exercise? Well, um, and, and the smoking thing is a good example because like, I mean, everybody made a choice at one point in their life to, to either start smoking or not, mm -hmm. you know, I yeah. mean, that's a conscious choice you made. Now, once you kind of make the choice to, to start smoking, it's a lot harder to make the choice to stop. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but we've both done that. We've done that though. Mm -hmm. I have done that, but, but I'm not saying that was like, I mean, that was a hard, like it, that mm -hmm. wasn't just something I woke up one day and was like, all right, I'm going to quit smoking now. Like that's kind of what I did. <laughs> it's, it, it, well, it was for me too, but it was more of a process, mm -hmm. but, but it was a conscious decision that I made. But, um, but like over, like, um, weight is like an epidemic in this country. Yeah. Like we've heard that for years now that the obesity is an, is a, is a epidemic. And there does seem to be a connection between obesity and bad results of getting COVID. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Which makes nothing but sense when you look at like just how viruses mm -hmm. and weight work. <laughs> I mean, but can you imagine going into a doctor um, and uh, like having, and you're an overweight person and you have your sugar checked and they're like, oh man, it looks like you have developed and then they do blood tests or whatever. Yeah. Um, looks like you've developed uh, type two diabetes. Well, you know, if you hadn't eaten so much and gotten overweight, you probably wouldn't have had this problem. So we're not treating it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, and <laughs> it's, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's crazy though. And like the, the smoking one stands out to me because like this is smoking has been a problem in this country for mm -hmm. a long time. Mm -hmm. And this, this attitude was never taken against smokers. Mm -hmm. Like, so why? Yeah. Why? Your doctor would berate you for being a smoker, but they didn't refuse yeah, to treat but you. But they didn't refuse care. Yeah. Um, and, and this, this is refusing care. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, for somebody f to just make a decision not to do something. And you were worried you were going to get care refused because you didn't have insurance. Yeah, right? <laughs> it's true, man. Yeah. Like, it's 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 insane. I, I don't know what the solution is, but it's... I, I think it's... Uh... I think it's representative, you know, a lot like, um, what's her name that was talking about? We'll just essentially just saying, let the, yeah. the people that refuse to get vaccinated starve. Yeah. Um, I, I think that it's, it represents a real lack of compassion and empathy in this country. Yeah. And I, I think that that, uh, that extends to a whole lot of things. I, I think that that, you know, that same thing is why we've still been in Afghanistan all this time. Why yeah. we're involved in Yemen. Why yeah. nobody even knew that we'd been fighting in Somalia since <laughs> 2002. Yeah. Um, you know, the, there's... The country's been at war so long that people just don't think about it anymore. Yeah. Like, I mean, even... Which a lot of what you just named isn't on the news barely at all, if ever. Mm -hmm. um, but even if it was, I think people tune a lot of that out. Yeah. I, I think it's just in their nature. And going back to the vaccine thing real quick, even though we do want to pivot... Um, I do know what the the solution is. The solution is is that for the vaccine thing, mm -hmm. just don't don't tell people whether you're vaccinated or not. Yeah, like, well, I mean, that's, see, it, it, this is another one of those things. Like that it should be private like, information oh, anyway. Should. But the the people that have been vaccinated will be happy to volunteer it, and the people that haven't been vaccinated won't. Yeah, and so it'll still be a default answer, really. Yeah. Um, it, it's just like the whole thing about lying to the police, yeah. you know, uh, okay, well, so it's all right to tell them that you're innocent if you're innocent, but if you tell them you're innocent when you're guilty, then it's a crime. Then that's a, yeah. Then they can charge you with that. <laughs> and okay. So then you have a choice between telling them you're innocent if you're innocent and not answering the question if you're guilty. Well, if you don't answer the question, then I mean, like, why, why would you yeah. not answer the question if you were innocent? Yeah. Oh. Right. I mean, 
I do that crap. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, sure. but, but I also like to push the limits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I don't mind going to jail. Which is why you're going to get shot by the police one day. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Yeah. So... Um, well, then you created your own problem and you deserve it. Uh, th- I guess so. <laughs> uh, I mean, by this logic, that's yeah. absolutely the case. Yeah. You know, so. Besides, you're a white guy. It doesn't <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I'm sure there are people that are listening like, oh, that guy's white. He's not getting shot by the police. Yeah. It's not true. Like, <laughs> yeah. I it, promise it I'm happens. just as afraid of the police as everyone else. <laughs> yeah. More so. than most. Oh, you know what? That <laughs> This is an odd pivot. But, um. There was a point, like, I got pulled over, I don't know, a month or so ago now yeah. um, for speeding in my residential area. <laughs> and uh, and I was irritated about it. I was. and yeah. um, But it, it occurred to me that, so I grew up in a law enforcement household. Yeah. Um, and we were given, uh, my brother and I were given, essentially, tips of how not to get a ticket. Yeah. All right. And so... They're pretty easy. <laughs> yeah, no, they are. <laughs> and and let me run through a few real quickly if you have never heard this before. Yeah. Um, first off, when they show up behind you, when you know the lights come on behind you, like if you're not pulling over immediately and pull over in a safe place, pull over on a side street, pull over under a light if it's dark. By the way, this is important anyway. Yeah. Um, but uh, both for your safety and for theirs, mm-hmm. uh, like essentially the whole goal is to make the police feel at ease, comfortable, right? Yeah. Um, and so if you're not pulling over immediately, like raise your hand or something, let them know that you see that turn your, the, what I was always told is turn your distressor zone. So you know that they recognize that you know that they're there, that you're not eluding or anything. Oh, and I was never told that. Uh, that's what I don't I was recommend told. it. Um, I, oh, what, I really, yeah, is I wouldn't recommend it. Well, because then you're, you could be giving them the false idea that you have some kind of emergency. Well, it's it's funny that you say not to do that because I posted on the Liberty Mike pages a couple of months ago uh-huh. um, a video of an officer. So the, what what happened is in the what you see in I the video. I didn't say don't do it. I said I wouldn't recommend it. Well, what happened in the video is is the person did exactly what I said. They turned the distressor zone mm-hmm. and didn't pull over because they were like on the interstate or something. Yeah. Um. And what the what the lady was gonna do was pull off on an exit and go somewhere uh, mm-hmm. so they weren't on the interstate. Mm-hmm. Um. What the cop did was a pivot mover. What what's, what do they call it when you run the car off the road? Yeah, where they the, the they pit push maneuver. the back. Yeah, the pit maneuver yeah. where they push the back of the car and and make you lose. He did. That's yeah. what he did to the woman. The woman was pregnant. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. So like maybe the the distress signal isn't the best thing to do, but that's what mm-hmm. I've always done. Yeah. Well, my law enforcement father never told me that. Fair enough. Okay. Um, <laughs> and you've never had a pit maneuver done to you. No, so. <laughs> I've never had a pit maneuver done to me. Um, I did do some interesting defensive driving stuff and some offensive driving stuff when I used to drive the ambulance. Anyway, yeah. that's all beside the point. Side of the point. Yeah. yeah. So, but like, you know, give them a signal that you, you see them. There. You intend to pull over. Yeah. yeah. So like, uh, you know, just like you would wave to somebody that lets you in, in traffic or whatever, just, you know, yeah. do that. Um, pull over at the earliest convenient point. Keep your hands on the wheel until yeah. they get up to the window. Yeah. Like literally like put it in park, put your hands on the wheel where they can see them until they get up to the window. Um, do not start digging into your glove box or anything. That's a terrible yeah. maneuver. Yeah, that's or a bad even idea. pulling your wallet out of your back pocket, whatever. So yeah. this does a couple of things. First off, um, if you're reaching into stuff, they don't know what you're after. Yep. Mm-hmm. Like you could be going into your glove box for a gun or into the, your waistband for a gun or whatever. You're like you've heard the waistband, waistband thing. Yeah. Like don't give them that excuse. Right? Yeah. Um, keep your hands on the wheel until they come up to the window. This is another thing that it does is it gives you time to talk to them yeah. while you're getting stuff. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't even roll the window down. The only thing that I recommend you do, and, and you used to have to reach forward to do it, but nowadays everybody's got controls for their radio on their yeah. steering wheel. Yeah. So just turn the volume down to nothing. Um, the old Dave Chappelle thing. Nobody wants to get their ass beat to a soundtrack. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, let them knock on the window, roll down the window, face them, be polite. Uh, when they ask for the things, you know, another thing that I... I don't know if there's like a trick to this or whatever, but um, just be honest with them in terms of like why you got pulled over. If yeah. they ask you if you know why you got pulled over and you do know, go ahead and say it. Yeah. Um, if you don't, 
say that too. Cause yeah. I, I've had to say that before. And you're like, you know, do you know why I pulled you no- over? No, I have no idea. Yeah. Um, I've had that, I've had that conversation quite a bit. It's usually because I wasn't doing anything illegal other than they wanted to check my tent. Yeah, well, I've been stopped multiple times in Baldwin County because, oh, your tent looked awful dark. Yeah. Like, well, it came with the car, so I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> and yeah. of course it was always fine. Mm-hmm. Like after the first time I was like, man, y'all just did this like a week ago. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, and then, uh, yeah, when they ask for the your stuff, license and registration, tell them where everything is. Yeah. Ask permission before you reach for it. Yeah. That's um, the big thing I was going to say is, so, like, license and registration, okay, it's in the glove box. I'm going to get it out. Like, let them, like mm-hmm. tell them what you're doing as, before you do it and whatnot yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and something else I always do is I always, when, they, when I handle my license, I handle my pistol permit mm-hmm. whenever... Um, I have my pistol permit behind my license in my wallet, so I slide it out so that you can see both. Yeah. Well, yeah. I make it a point to handle them both mm-hmm. because, I mean, I always have a weapon, in, at least one weapon in the car. Yeah. Um, and so, and it's... I've, I haven't gotten a ticket since I've started doing that, and every time the conversation goes the same way. They ask if I have a weapon. Yes, sir. They're like, will you leave yours where it's at? I'll leave mine where it's at. Mm-hmm. Like, every time that's what they've said back to me. Yeah. So <laughs> That must be part of the training it, down it, here. It, uh, maybe. I mean, it's <laughs> Alabama. So, yeah. um, But years ago, I actually got stopped um, going pretty fast in the vet on 59, mm-hmm. and I had Callie with me. Mm-hmm. And basically everything you just ran through is pretty well – the what what I did yeah. and um I did not get a ticket that night and yeah. I definitely deserved one. <laughs> well, the, yeah, I mean, in this particular time I um I got asked a question that I wasn't expecting. Yeah. Um, they asked me who my employer was and I did a double take at that and I I, yeah. I gave her a look like what I, yeah. and I, so but I answered the question. Yeah. Um, and then after they gave me the warning when she was uh when they were getting ready to leave and we were all getting ready to go our own directions. Yeah. And I, like I said, I got a warning. I didn't get a ticket. Yeah. Um, in the end of this either, I said, excuse me, I do have a question for you though. Yeah. And, and I asked her, I was like, why are you asking for my employer? Yeah. I mean, because my first instinct when she asked that question was none of your business. Was, yeah. Not to answer it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, but this is easy enough to find. You have my driver's license, Yeah. you know, my name address, like, um, you know. and what the, did she, what did they say? Oh, uh, the answer was, um, so that they have another way of tracking you down if you don't show up to court or, hmm. and you don't pay the fine or because, whatever, um, which I think is kind of BS, but well, it I'll wasn't s- worth fighting about before I got the warning. <laughs> I will say, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I will say this, I've, when I've gotten tickets and thinking mm-hmm. back on it, I'm pretty sure my employer, I don't remember specifically being asked, mm-hmm. but I'm pretty sure at least one of the tickets I got years ago now, mm-hmm. um, had my employer on it. Yeah. Like it was on the ticket. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so. I figured they have access to that information. So it, there wasn't any sense in, in holding back on that, but I was caught off guard by the question. Yeah, that would be so. And I take your tact, especially when I'm, when I, like I say, I hadn't had a ticket in years and I've been stopped a few times at least where I deserved mm-hmm. one. Um, is that's always if you want to get out of a ticket, that's the best way to go about it. Is yeah. be polite and be be as easygoing as you can. The more but, time, you, the more FaceTime essentially that you get with the officer, the less likely you are to get a ticket. Yeah. Um, as long as that FaceTime is pleasant, positive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Now, if you you know, if I had immediately started arguing with her about whether yeah. she deserved to know who my employer was or whatever, yeah. I definitely would have gotten a ticket. You're getting a ticket in that um, scenario. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean the the you know, that's a big part of like not doing anything till they ask and telling them what you're doing and, and maybe chatting with them a little bit if it's, yeah. if something comes up in between yeah. and so forth is that you like humanize yourself. Yeah. I think giving them the pistol permit does a lot of that for you too. Mm-hmm. I think it like, you know, I, I think it helps. It's, it's yeah. worked for me. So. There's a few things I've had under my license over the years. Yeah. Um, I used to have my Eagle Scout card. Ah. Um, I have had my father's uh, business card. Yeah. Um, you know, FBI <laughs> SWAT, blah, blah, blah. Right. right. Yeah. Um, th- yeah. There, there's yeah. a few things, things I've had over things, the years. Things like, like that. Uh, yeah. it, can't, it can't hurt, right? When I was 17, I got pulled over. This is gone <laughs> like totally off the rails here. So yeah. we will get back to a real point. <laughs> I promise. Yeah. Um, when I was 17, I got pulled over and I got released, uh, with a verbal warning and the, the police officer never even took my driver's license. Really? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Like, yeah. 
And so he didn't, I mean, there were times where I got off because of who my dad was. Yeah. Um, because somebody knew him or yeah. whatever. Um, and, uh, and there was one time where I got a, a, a ticket in my driveway <laughs> and my dad fixed it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Cause which that is was... the only ticket he has ever fixed for anybody in the family, I think. Yeah. Um, and because <laughs> and I, I asked him why, and he was like, well, I just thought that was bull. <laughs> give, <laughs> give me your ticket in the driveway. Give it's... a man the ticket in his own driveway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's like, you should have just kept walking inside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, That's awesome. Yeah. Um, my name doesn't have that effect. My name, my last name tends to, to get you tickets, not get you out of them. Yeah. Well, it, my last name doesn't do me any good anymore. Nobody knows him anymore. Yeah. It's been too long. Yeah. So, I mean, this was when I was a teenager. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, not so, anymore. Nobody, nobody knows who he is now. Yeah, no, my last name will definitely get you in some, get, get more questions asked. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but you know, 25 years ago, my dad taught firearms to a lot of the guys. To most of those guys. Yeah. yeah so. Absolutely. You know, and I would get, are you any kin to, yes, I am. That's my father. As a matter of fact, it is. Yeah. <laughs> so um, anyway, I don't remember what we were talking about before we got down this path. I don't know, um, but like I say, it's something about, I don't even remember. But yeah, it's good advice, though, like to just life mm-hmm. advice as far as dealing with law enforcement. Mm-hmm. Like that's definitely, if you want to get out of it, that's the way to go. Now, if you want to cause problems, there's you can listen to some other takes. But. Yeah. Well, and I have a different feeling when they start talking about um, searching your car. Oh, yeah. That's that's where it usually goes south for me. And I haven't had encountered that in years now. Yeah. I but that that used I used to have my car searched regularly. Yeah. I guess I just give off that aroma. But um, <laughs> like I say, it was that that happened a lot. And, and it always went south from there. Like, yeah. Because, yeah, I'm not just um, going to consent to that. <laughs> yeah, I um, I don't I can't recall having ever actually had my car searched. But I have had a couple of fights about it. I've I've had my car um, searched and I've had many a fight about it. And I have definitely gotten tickets when I have not oh, yeah. permitted my car to be searched. Yeah. yeah. Um, you can count and on and that. then in the end what they did uh at least one time the one time that I remember, they didn't actually go through my car, but they brought the dog. Yeah. And they yeah. sniffed around. Yeah. Um, they couldn't signal the dog to, to signal. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> was, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, oh, we'd have had a fight about that too. I <laughs> definitely would have ended up in jail that night. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, there's like, generally speaking, if you give respect, you'll get respect. Yeah, no, that's true. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Yeah. And the, but the main thing is to put them at ease yeah. because they never know when they're pulling somebody over what's going to happen. Oh yeah. So the more at ease you can put them, the, the, the more calm they can feel like they can be. Yeah the less chance you have of getting a ticket. Yeah. I'd agree with that. Yeah. Um, well, there is some breaking news today. Yeah. Uh, a couple of bombs went off at, in um, Kabul. So you had mentioned that when I was on the way over, and, mm-hmm. and I had gotten a news update, but I didn't even click on it on my phone, that, that, that you know, there, I saw that there had been some bombings or whatever. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you, man, like, who couldn't have seen that coming? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, General uh, McMaster said um, um, that that was just the beginning, and he is urging Biden to change course. Oh, of course. I, and he's to pr- go back into Afghanistan. Oh, I absolutely. Because, obviously, the way to prevent future <laughs> U.S. servicemen from getting killed yeah. is by putting them back in harm's way. Yeah. Well, yeah. And now you're talking about a situation where the Taliban has taken over the country and you're talking about going back in. That's that's going to be a bloodbath yeah. on both sides. Um, but the deal with the bombing doesn't surprise me because, I mean, the, the, they've, the Taliban has taken over Mm-hmm. Like the Kabul and everything, like it's and and it that airport is a disaster right now. Well, okay, and so let me ask a question of you. Yeah, do you think the Taliban is responsible for the bombing? Probably not. My guess would be that they're not. Now mm-hmm. they, I don't know that they'll be accused of it in our media, regardless. Um, but I would be surprised if they're responsible for it. Okay. I, I think that they're gonna. I think that the Taliban is doing everything they can to mm-hmm. hold up their end, but. There's only so much they can do. They don't control every aspect of every person in the country, no more than our government controls every aspect of us. Yeah. Um, and that that airport is a mess. Yeah. Like. Well, that that was my first reaction too. Um, now the I had to uh, 
I had to go easy, I guess you'd say. That's not the right expression, but it's the first thing that comes to mind. Yeah. Um, with the person that told me about this this afternoon. Yeah. And uh, because he was all ready to go back into Afghanistan and fight another war. Yeah. Um, you know, he was, uh, you know, just sickened by it. You know, 12 Marines dead. Uh, if I was 35 years younger, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I get it. What I kept, you know, I, I pushed one of my brother's favorite um, quotes. Yeah. Um, which is, I, I said, you know, I, I don't see that going back in there fight for more years. I actually, at first I stole a quote from Scott Horton, yeah. um, who actually got a spot on Fox. Oh, nice. It was Fox business. Eh, yeah, still though. But yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, he said, well, you know, it, we got to be happy that we're leaving. You know, this is, the, this is the greatest thing that um, Donald Trump and Joe Biden have ever done in their lives yeah. is leave Afghanistan. And um, that, uh, you know, regardless of the situation now, um, you, you know, it doesn't do any good to fight for three more years and have the Taliban win anyway. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, first I said that, and then I, I gave him, uh, you know, one of Daniel's favorite quotes, which is the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. And the second best time is today. Yeah. 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 That's, that's like, a good one. it's still the right thing to leave this yeah, country it because is. you want to, you want to prevent Americans from getting killed in Afghanistan. Don't have Americans in Afghanistan. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, mean that's the, and know, I, the easy answer. Yeah, um, um, uh, like I say, I I get the I get the urge though to mm-hmm. be like, well, they hit us, we got to hit mm-hmm. them back. Yeah, but that's what got us here. Yeah, like, but well, when I got to talk about it, yeah. like you know, really speak openly with somebody else about it, I was like, I can't. I can't imagine that the Taliban did this. No. It, is, it does not serve it their makes, interests. It makes no sense for them to be responsible yeah. for this. So then when I got home, I got to read a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I can't remember where the article is from. I only had time to read one. Um, yeah. it, but what I said at the office is that my guess would be that it was, um, you know, ISIS-K, uh, yeah. or you know, ISIS in the course on it. I'm pretty sure is the ISIS group that's, uh, that's um, Afghanistan, there. Pakistan. Yeah. Um, or uh, or some other group like that. Yeah. Um, that I said it wouldn't surprise me if it was some you know leftover from the Afghan government that we propped up, well, uh, trying to provide an excuse for the U.S. to stay to prop up that government some more. Yeah. Um, but when I got home, I got to read an article uh, really quickly about it, and of course, you know, they're pushing what a disaster it is for us leaving, and you know, it's typical mainstream media right now. The worst thing we could do is end a war. Yeah. Um, but they did say that it was uh, the um, an ISIS group from the area. Yeah. Um, so that they was claiming, actually, have they actually claimed responsibility? Yeah, claimed responsibility. I mean, that makes sense. Um, and of course, the Taliban and ISIS are enemies. Yeah. Of each other, I mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> so, you know, which, not just enemies of us, but it, it certainly serves ISIS interest to have us stay and continue fighting the Taliban, too. Oh, yeah, we're fighting their war for them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, there's, there's there's a there's lot. Just, I tell you, the, I hadn't consumed as much media this week as I, I would have liked to, but the, but the stuff I have seen and, and watched... The, the push so hard right now is for us to, they're trying everything they can to make us stay. Mm-hmm. And is it, even going as far as like CNN and a bunch of these um, MSNBC and all these that have had Biden's back this whole time, like they don't have his back anymore now. Like yeah. they have all kind of pulled their support and they're going hard on Biden over this. Um, and it's not, like I say, it's... It's not good for it's not good for Biden. Um, I hate to see him. I don't. I'm no fan of Biden, but I hate to see him be punished for something good that he's doing. Yeah. Um. I mean, I. I and like and and Trump owes some responsibility here too. I mean, or some credit for pulling us out. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, he did at least. He could have done it a lot earlier, yeah. but at least he did like make the agreement with the Taliban and and all of that. <laughs> yeah, you kind of have to. Um, pay a little tribute to the cleverness of Trump in this, also. Yeah. Uh, in the his timing for May. Yeah. Um, first off, it's at the beginning of the of the fighting season. I know some people yeah. are like, "What in the world do you mean by the fighting season?" Afghanistan is very mountainous. Yeah. And there are specific ways that you can pass through. They're called passes. Yeah. Uh, through the mountains. Yeah. Um, and they can be snowed and iced over. 
And so in the spring, when the snow starts to melt, that's when the fighting season begins, when they can really move troops from place to place. Yeah. Um, So it would have been the beginning of the fighting season, which means that they couldn't have had troops in place everywhere. Yeah. Um, And also it was a a point in time where um, if he had been reelected and things went badly... He's like got time to now. fix it, right? <laughs> yeah. Like he and if um, if he isn't reelected, yeah, it ain't his problem. <laughs> then then it's it's so, yeah. It, well, also it was so early in the next administration that they couldn't really undo it in the time that they had. Oh yeah. I mean, they could have. Yeah. But that would have been a mess too. Oh yeah. Especially with the majority of the well, American people in favor of leaving I'll Afghanistan. I'll tell you, and, and I've heard this one rolled out a bunch. We may have talked about it on one of the podcasts where these, um, I know we've talked about it on the podcast, but it's worth mentioning again mm-hmm. um, because I've heard it rolled out again that, you know, well, it was a minimal cost to stay, a, a handful, a couple of thousand troops, you know, to maintain the country. That's only true because we were leaving. Like yeah. had we, we had already made a deal, we there had was already a made, in there place. was a ceasefire in place. Had we not made that deal, it would still be full war over there. And if Biden had came in the off and been like, all right, we're leaving our troops there. We're going to hold this government together, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. Mm-hmm. All out war again. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's just that's that's just the truth. Mm-hmm. So any any time you hear that, like that's one that I've heard a couple of times the past, yeah. even this past week, that that just every time I hear it, it makes my blood boil. It's like, yeah. man, like like that's so dishonest. Well, there's a there's a real lack of uh, of compassion and empathy with that anyway. Um, in that, yeah, okay, so there's been about 5,000 Americans lost, and what they'll tell you over and over again is something like 2,700 U.S. troops killed yeah. during the war. Um, that doesn't include something like another 2,500 U S contractors over there. Some of whom were probably mercenaries. Um, then the other part of that is that they keep giving you an estimate of something like 50,000 Afghan civilians killed. Yeah. But independent sources are suggesting it's more like 150,000. Um, Afghan civilian, civilians, civilians, killed. yeah. Um, so they consistently underestimate that. And one of the things that we know from the the Manning and the um, the Daniel Hale leaks um, is that what the U.S. military would call any fighting age male yeah. a, an enemy combatant. So if they dropped a drone bomb on <laughs> four. 13 year olds playing soccer. So I think yeah. the, the rule was if they were over 12. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so if they dropped a drone bomb on, you know, four, you know, 14 year olds playing soccer, yeah. those were enemy combatants in the statistics. Yeah. It's garbage, man. And so, and the, you know, we talked about them doing the same thing in uh, Vietnam. If you remember like our, yeah. our conspiracies <laughs> yeah, dude. Uh, episode yeah. a while back. Um, where anybody, any Vietnamese who was killed in an area where there was fighting was considered an enemy combatant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, like regardless of what they're doing, yeah. you know, mother breastfeeding her child, if she was in an area where fighting was going on and she was killed and her child was killed, that was two enemy combatants, the infant and the breastfeeding mother. And I just want to remind people, how would we feel if this was going on in our country? Yeah. How would we feel if the Chinese or the Russians or name your enemy mm-hmm. was over here attacking us this way yeah um and trying to rule our country this way like where would you stand in that (laughs) like would you be like just compliant or would Mm -hmm. you be no i'm gonna pick up my rifle and go fight (laughs) well and this is one of those things that has just never made sense to me and it's you know this is where you know the principles start to step in like you can't you can't enforce freedom on people yeah you can't impose freedom on people yeah. it's not freedom if you imposed it on them, <laughs> right right like there's a contradiction right there in and of itself if people yeah. pe- let people live the life that they want to live this is one of the things that i think is really important about libertarianism and and i'll say you know this um this guy i was arguing with a while back was really upset with me um for claiming uh nonpartisanship or whatever um, and said something along the lines of, well, you call it the Russia hoax, so you have a position. Well, of course I have a position, but it's not, it's not dictated by a party affiliation. Yeah. My, my party affiliation follows my positions. My positions do not follow my party affiliation. 
Absolutely. Right. Um, and I think and that if that's these r- parties were better, we would have, <laughs> like, I could pick a party and stick with it. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's not that I don't have an opinion. It's that yeah. my opinion isn't influenced by whether it comes from the Republicans or the Democrats. That's not yeah. the point. It doesn't are the, matter. Are the libertarians, like, also, like yes. I'm a, I consider myself a libertarian, but I disagree with libertarians all the time. Yeah. Like, yeah absolutely. But you got to remember in the, in the wider world, world of the united states there's only two points of view yeah fair (laughs) enough i mean that's true um but at any rate uh so like i do i think that people should be free to make their own choices about their lives yeah i do even if that choice is that they don't want to be free yeah well and you and it's it at least in the way that we look at freedom it amazes me that the biden administration particularly has been so shocked that the taliban just like took the country over within the matter of days. I mean, for one, anybody that was paying any attention should have seen that coming, Mm -hmm. Um, that these guys were not going to fight for that government. Like The only reason they were fighting for that government was because we were there. Well, I mean, here's another thing that Scott Horton pointed out, um, that the blame for this doesn't lie at Biden's feet. It lies at the general's feet that have been lying to him. Well, yeah. Uh, and have been lying to presidents for years about how they've built up this, up this 300,000 man national army that could stand up to the Taliban. Yeah. It was just a fantasy. It's, that was it, the Scots word. It was yeah. just a fantasy. Well, and he, and, but Scott's absolutely right. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, in anybody that was like Scott knew this, like, mm-hmm. I mean, anybody that was really but paying Biden attention. might not. I mean, well, I, I, I'm willing to bet Biden didn't. And yeah. that's kind of, but that's kind and of probably my, Trump didn't either. It, but it's just amazing to me, though, mm-hmm. that they could not. Like them to be in the position they're in and not know that. Yeah. Well, you know? yeah. I mean, but you in that position, you can't keep track of everything. Yeah. You're reliant on those people that are supposed to tell you the That's truth. They're supposed to give you the good information. If well, um, no, they're supposed to give you the the correct information. Yeah. What yeah. they were doing was giving the good information. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. But at the same time, like if you're really paying attention. Like if you were reading the Washington Post a year ago when the Afghanistan papers came out, you knew that all that stuff was was a lie. Yeah. Um, if you had been reading the Saigar reports, the um, Special Inspector General for Afghan Reconstruction, if you'd been reading those over the years, you would know all that stuff was yeah. a lie. Yeah, but you're talking about the Pentagon and whatnot. Like they have a vested interest in this not going well. Absolutely. Like I, I mean, this has been a cash cow for twenty years. Yeah, and they don't they don't want to see it in, and they don't want to see the next one in. Yeah. And Um, that's why the media is so involved in this, too, is because they do get their sponsorships from Boeing and Lockheed Martin and all these places. Like, this is one of those things that we've talked about from the very beginning of the podcast. Like, when you're watching the news, especially, like, I always saw it on on PBS. Yeah, PBS is the most blatant with it. Yeah, where you have an advertisement for, you know, sponsored by Lockheed Martin or whatever. Lockheed Martin is not selling anything to you and me. Yeah, no, no, no joke. (laughs) And, And they're not selling anything to PBS either. No. They're buying something from PBS. No, they're, exactly. They're buying good coverage. Yep, yep, absolutely. And, Favorable and it's, coverage. And it's, well, and it's blatant right there for you to mm-hmm. see. Yeah. Right? You, know. you and I aren't buying from Boeing either. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, honestly, it amazes me that they even Northrop make, Grumman, like all of these things. Well, it yeah. amazes me that PBS and stuff even play those snippets, like mm-hmm. sponsored by blah, 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 because it's like, like why? Like anybody with half a brain sees that and is like, "Well, why are they sponsoring this?" Well, I think they're counting on that most people have already turned it off because they don't do it till the very end of the program. Well, they do it in the beginning too. Oh, I, I watch a lot changed. of I, I, uh, I watch a lot of PBS. They I, do I it at the beginning have, and yeah, the end. I don't even yeah. have TV, so I haven't watched any of that in a long so. time. Yeah, no, they, but, they, they make those. It, it just amazes me that maybe they Maybe I even, never caught the beginning, but I, always, I would always see it at the end of the news hour. Yeah, yeah, they do it at the beginning and the end. Mm-hmm. So the sponsors. Well, um, you know, regardless, and unfortunately this won't change because yeah. while we can be excited about them leaving Afghanistan, and, and I am, um, and I am happy that Joe Biden has done this. And I recognize that things have not gone as well as they could have, but I don't hold him responsible for this. Like I said last time, no. I mean, and especially like all these NGOs and so forth that are trapped in the country, you have had plenty of warning yeah. that the U.S. was leaving. Yeah. Plenty of warning. And the reason it's such a, such a debacle, I think, um, is two things. First, it, well, I mean, I don't know. Um, you know, I am, I am jaded enough to believe that this was intentional. Um, 
or even if it wasn't intentional, it wasn't done with good intentions. Yeah. Um, I think that it was either intentionally done in that, well, if we make this look like a complete disaster to leave a war, that'll give warning to anybody about leaving any wars in the future. Yeah. Um, the other thing is what I said last time, which is uh, that I think that, that a lot of these um, high-ranking military officers were so convinced that they weren't actually going to have to leave, that they would be able to either strong arm the president or convince the president to stay in after Trump left office, yeah. um, that they never actually made any plans to leave. Yeah. And, and they didn't do any preparation. And then it became a scramble at the end when they were like, Oh God, I can, I think we've lost this. Yeah. And, and, and at any rate, they're the ones to blame here. Yeah. And I, I really wish that the American people would like really, like make a big deal about that and not take this out on Biden and take it out on the, put the blame where the blame belongs. Well, and unfortunately there we've had decades now of really glorifying military leaders. Yeah. Um, nobody, nobody in mainstream media criticizes general Petraeus or HR McMaster or any of these guys that lost this war. Yeah. And I don't think that yeah. they could have won. So I, I don't yeah. even mean it to be like, you know, the, oh, these guys were idiots. If we'd have just had better people in place that we would have won this yeah. war. I, I mean, think if we'd have had were... better people in place, we wouldn't have entered this war. Yeah, we would have left or, or at least went in and out and left quick. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, there is every reason to. And so I don't even know if, if a lot of people know this. I mean, we played a little a bit from Scott Horton at the end of our last episode where he goes through. Um, the various levels where we could have not even entered a war in Afghanistan, yeah. that they were offering us uh, yeah. Osama bin Laden. Yeah. Um, if we could just show some evidence that he'd been responsible. Well, even without evidence, we'll just, uh, we'll send him to any Muslim country. Okay. We don't need evidence and we won't even have to send him to a Muslim country. We can just send him to any third country. We're just not sending them to the U S and we turned it down over and over again. Yeah. And then we had him trapped along the Pakistan border, mm -hmm. but we didn't have enough troops and to cover the whole border, to make sure that he didn't escape into Pakistan. And they asked for more troops and they were denied. Yeah. And there is strong argument to the idea that we lit him, that the highest levels of government yeah. let him escape across the border into Pakistan because if you in, if you kill bin Laden there, you can't continue the terror war. Or yeah. it makes it a lot harder to it make makes, the case. Yeah, exactly. And we wanted to go into Iraq. And mm -hmm. we wanted to get rid of Gaddafi. And we wanted to, you know, we actually had, at the we, time. We, we had big plans. Yeah. Like, I mean, the 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 top of, top leadership in government had big plans to go mm -hmm. into all of those countries. Yeah, remember Wesley Clark's thing about exactly. you know, uh, yeah. seven countries in five years. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, and uh, so... Like this, this would have created a problem if we had actually killed Osama bin Laden at the very beginning and before the end of 2001, like we could have. Yeah. Yeah. It Lighten. would have made it really hard to continue to pursue this into other countries. Yep. Exactly. You couldn't, it, it would have been hard to get the American people behind you. Of course, yeah. now we've seen that they don't even care if they have the American people behind you. Yeah. I mean, they're, you know, well, they're ignoring the majority in America so that they can enforce majority rule in another country, which is, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Yeah. It's a little bit of irony there. Yeah. So, but um, it just goes back to people just are tuned out of it. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I just, I, unfortunately, that's just the case, you know? Yeah. So. And that, but that comes from us being at war for so long. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, because it, it took a lot of convincing and a lot of like screws being put to, to get us into Afghanistan and then Iraq. But now we just go into countries like it's no thing. Mm -hmm. But it's because this country has been at war for so long. Yeah. Um, I mean, that it's just, it's not even paid attention to hardly. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, um, I mean, I, I want to say though that, uh, Maybe it only passed one, one of the houses in Congress, but uh, I could swear that we were just repealing the 2002 AUMF. I heard something about. But that's the little one. That's not yeah. The big one. I, I I heard something about that, but I didn't get any details on it. Mm -hmm. I don't know the specifics behind that. But yeah, I, I can't remember if I read that it had been done or that it had been just passed by one. It was it was brought up uh, for sure because I heard yeah. about it, but that's all I really heard. Anyway. So, I mean, at least it seems like in this regard, we're moving in the right direction. On the home front, less so. Well, 
Yeah, no, the home front's scary. And just one more thing as far as Afghanistan, like just one of my biggest fears is, so we are winding down this war and bringing the guys home, which mm-hmm. is amazing. I hope you're going where I was trying to go earlier and got sidetracked. I don't know. My <laughs> my fear is is that they're ratcheting up China. Yeah, that, well, and that's it. The, this is the thing, you know, that, um, that I meant to, that I was kind of pointing myself in the direction of and got distracted yeah. um, a, a few minutes ago is that, yeah, we're leaving Afghanistan and we're very excited about that, yeah. but that's not the end of the sentence. Yeah. The, that's... the end of the sentence is we're leaving Afghanistan because we need these troops available to, to on our pivot to China, to harass China. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, and so that's, uh, th- that's even a greater fear, yeah. but that's a bigger gravy train for all of these military contractors, which is what's so scary because it, you're right. It is I like the big warships and all of mm-hmm. that stuff. That's all money for Lockheed Martin and all of these groups. But I'm telling you, like that puts the entire world in danger. Yeah. Um, like, I mean, like the truth is, is Afghanistan was never a threat to us. They're not mm-hmm. never going to really like that. That was that was a war that was going to be over there mm-hmm. and it was always going to be over there. Yeah. Um, a war with China will not be that way. Landlocked and, country with no air force, Afghanistan. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like they're not. I mean, con- they might have an air force now. Well, yeah, <laughs> they almost certainly have an air force now. <laughs> but um, yeah, no. That they were never a real threat to us, but mm-hmm. China, like, that's a war that's going to hit home. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's. Well, I, I mean, can you even imagine having the arrogance to believe that you could fight a war against China in the South China Sea? Yeah, that's not going to work. Like, <laughs> it, it's it's just not going to happen. Like, I mean, it's just not. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's well, that's going to show up on our shores. Um, is that 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 arrogance exists in Washington? It DC. does. Um, I I read like I'm so glad. So I read this article like a week ago, and then I heard uh, uh, Daniel McAdams and Scott Horton talking about it on a podcast. You yeah. know, um, Daniel McAdams is of course yeah, Ron Paul's Ron Paul's guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, his foreign policy advisor when he was uh, in the House. Oh, I didn't know that. I know he does a podcast with him now, and yeah. I like him. Yeah. Um, well, that's that's how. The, well, I don't know that's if that's how they, how they to... know each other, but anyway, yeah. yeah, he was Ron Paul's foreign policy advisor. Oh, cool. Um, anyway, uh, there was a uh, an article, I think it was by Jim Bovard, um, where he was talking about uh, his, you know, going on a little nature walk um, outside of D.C. and uh, talking with a um, with one of these, you know, involved in um, bureaucracy people, yeah, and. And they were both saying, yeah, I mean, Daniel McAdams was saying, yeah, this is actually a, this little vignette is a perfect representation of the attitude in DC. And uh, essentially it's, you know, this girl talking about, um, you know, some great thing that we're doing and some, which is actually some stupid foreign policy (laughs) thing. Yeah. And, um, Bovard, uh, being, um, really well read on the subject is, is asking questions or challenging her a little bit. And her attitude is really just to kind of dismiss it all and say, well, you know, you don't know things that I know. Um, You know, I see these top secret memos, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I mean, that's not exactly. But that's the, that's the arrogance that that exists. Like we know better than you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so we're doing the right thing. And um, (laughs) regardless of what they can see in front of them, they'd rather trust the, the, top secret memo than what they can see with their own eyes, essentially. Yeah. And, um, and I've been reading the, uh, the doomsday machine by Daniel Ellsberg. Yeah. And that's something that he talks about too, in the military, yeah. um, is that, you know, the, when there was a challenge from the presidential, from the executive, um, the commander in chief, yeah. uh, about, um, war plans or how they were stationing, uh, nuclear weapons or what the dangers were, or, you know, how far authority should be delegated or, um, them putting, uh, uh, treaties in danger by some of their positioning and, you know, things like this, that these, uh, these military guys were like, he's just a civilian. What does he know? Yeah. Yeah. And this is in regards to Kennedy, who actually had been a naval officer, um, but he <laughs> right. wasn't he wasn't a general or an admiral or something like that. I mean, and they just yeah. had Eisenhower who was right. But it, what's amazing to me is that that so you're absolutely right. Like they there's an arrogance about in in those high ranks like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we just watched the Pentagon completely 
blow up this deal, whether you believe intentionally or unintentionally, mm-hmm. this exit to Afghanistan. But yeah. then we're going to trust these and same... And the whole war. Don't forget the whole war. Yeah. Like, this is another part of the problem is that we're concentrating on this disaster of, of leaving Afghanistan. Yeah. But what about the last 20 years in Afghanistan? Well, true. It's been a disaster too. No, absolutely. Um, and then we're going to trust them to help us deal with China? <laughs> Like, I mean, seriously, like, I Some mean, people should get fired, but they won't. Well, and they never will. And it's, it's all kind of a, a result of just too big of a military. Like mm-hmm. we, we just don't need this military machine. Yeah. Like, I mean, it, we just, it, to have a military machine, like what we have is to, to be an empire. Like, I mean, that's the only reason you have it. Like we don't need this military to defend our borders. We've talked about this on the podcast before. Yeah. Um, we, it, you, but there's, there's too much money involved. There's no way to tear it down. Yeah. Um, there's the, uh, the Heinlein quote that I like that I always paraphrase cause I can't remember the exact quote uh, yeah. that says something along the lines of, uh, it is a truism that any group cult or sect will legislate its beliefs into law if given the political power to do so. Yeah. Um, I, I think another truism that we can add to that um, is that uh, any um, group, if let me let me see if how I can form this so it's a nice aphorism too. Yeah. Um, I don't think I can. I should have thought about this before. I mean, it just came to mind. <laughs> yeah. uh, but um, essentially, any group once it once it consolidates a certain amount of power, regardless of its original purpose, its purpose becomes to perpetuate itself. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where we're at. Like, I mean, that is, that is our military at this point, you know, and it just, it doesn't have to be this way. And our government. Our government. I tell you what I really would like to see happen with us bringing these troops home from Afghanistan is really making a big deal about these guys coming home. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that would do more to end the war machine than I think anything. Yeah. You know, really make a parade out of these guys coming home. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Just a thought, but I mean, it, the media is not going to do that. Though. Yeah, well, and probably they won't come home. They'll just be redirected to well, the that's, theaters. And that's I a, mean, we're still yeah. fighting in Somalia. Yeah, um, we're still involved in Yemen. We're yeah. fighting in Mali. Yeah, you know, we got people in Libya. We got people in Syria. Oh we, yeah, there's I, plenty of places for them to go. Yeah, other than home where they should be. Right. You know. Um. Anything more? Well, this. This went totally different than, well, I didn't have much of a plan anyway. <laughs> I was going to say, we didn't exactly, <laughs> like, usually we have at least somewhat of a plan. We didn't really have one tonight. <laughs> yeah. We were, we were hoping to have a grand plan, and that didn't happen. Yeah, right. <laughs> so happy 100th episode. Absolutely. Um, happy 100th episode. Congrats on the 100th episode. There to ourselves. <laughs> to ourselves. Pat ourselves on Hey, man, we've kept this going this long. We have. Yeah. And we have no plans to stop, so. Absolutely. Um, only getting bigger yeah only bigger yeah, i hope yeah <laughs> really hope so um all right well uh then in that case we'll go ahead and wrap things up um follow us on facebook uh subscribe on youtube itunes podbean um you can always check our website at the that's the liberty yeah. um and uh you can email me anytime uh with ideas um, with, uh, articles, with whatever questions. I don't care. Yeah. Um, at Michael at the Liberty And, uh, we'll plan to be back here in a week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.